Is the U.S. being manipulated into a war in the Middle East to benefit Russia, Iran, and China? I know it's difficult to see now, but when you look at the actions, the rhetoric, and the underlying motives of the countries that are pulling the strings in this, it might be exactly what's happening. And now amid the Israel-Hamas war, according to reports, China has sent six warships to the Middle East due to risk of escalation of the conflict. To that end, the crew of the guided missile destroyer USS Kearney, operating in the northern Red Sea earlier today, shot down three land attack cruise missiles and several drones that were launched by Houthi forces in Yemen. According to the Kuwaiti newspaper Al Jarida, Iran is working toward a complex arms deal that would move some Hezbollah weapons in Syria and Lebanon to Russia. Particularly when it comes to China and its intentions in Taiwan, is a distracted world the right time for them to hurry things up? Well, of course it would be. In this video, I'm going to explain how the world appears to be choosing sides and marching off to war. I'll also alert you to the supply chain issues that we've monitored for about a year. It's time you knew about it so you can really begin to prepare for its impact. The Ukraine situation may be locked in a stalemate, and there's some data you should know about as you prepare for this winter. I'll also announce the winner of last week's giveaway, and I'll tell you what we're going to be giving away in this video and how you can be eligible to win it. Also, if you haven't checked out our new membership area for the city prepping community, we just launched it yesterday. We had a few hiccups yesterday getting the site off to a start, but the issues have been smoothed out and we're already getting a lot of solid engagement inside of it. We did our first live hangout yesterday and we have several more this week lined up for the members. I hope you can join us for those. So definitely check it out by visiting cityprepping.com or clicking on the link in the description and comments section below. I hope to see you over there. All right, so let's jump into the news. It's all here in the prepper headlines that you need to know this week. Israel. In as short of an explanation that I can give of just what has occurred on October the 7th, Hamas, a group in the Gaza Strip that is a proxy army to Iran, both supplied and trained by Iran, they attacked Israeli civilians. Now, Hamas militants stormed into Israel from Gaza, killed over 1,400 people, and took some 240 others hostage in a rampage that Israel described as the deadliest attack on Jews since the Holocaust. Now, the hostages were brought into the Gaza Strip as a bargaining and ransom opportunity, but also in hopes that it would prevent Israel from bombing the Gaza Strip. Well, Israel did that anyway, and the country aggressively attacked Hamas anywhere in the Gaza Strip where they could be located. Now, most recently, the Israeli Defense Forces spokesman has accused Hamas of embedding their fighters in the network of tunnels throughout Gaza, primarily in and under hospitals and medical facilities. Now, in one case, reports of a Hamas terror cell was using an ambulance to transport militants and conduct their operations. Now, Israel has released footage verifying this use of medical facilities, and in one case, Hamas operated a launch pad for missiles and stores missiles just 75 meters or 245 feet from a hospital. It's a well-documented underdog strategy to embed outnumbered and outgunned forces among civilian populations. Now, this has led to some high-profile Israeli strikes in and around medical facilities and on ambulance convoys, and that's what Hamas wants. It makes Israel appear that their tactics are too heavy-handed. Now, Hamas has rejected Israel's assertions that it used hospitals to shield an underground military network as having no basis in truth. Now, to the Arab world, it makes Israel appear to be an oppressor in a larger holy war. And to the rest of the world, it gives countries pause before committing any support to Israel. So the tactic, though Hamas denies it, works in their favor. Now, look, I'll be honest. It's hard trying to report on this issue in a non-biased manner, as I find myself struggling to make sure that the information I present on this issue is not just some biased perspective. And we try our hardest to dig deep into the information to ensure we're reporting this correctly. Now, look, I'm not going to lie to you. It's a mess all the way around. Iran, a country aligned in bricks with Russia and China, is fighting a proxy war in Israel. They've threatened to wipe off the map. And who provides funding, military support, training, and armnets to Hamas and Hezbollah on Israel's northern border continues to threaten Israel, but has now threatened the United States? Iran's Minister of Defense said that the United States would be hit hard if it didn't implement an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Now, Iran considers the U.S. to be militarily involved in the conflict. And this begs the question about the extent of the U.S. involvement in the conflict. Apart from the 10 American warships off the coast and now an Ohio-class nuclear submarine, Secretary of State Blinken has met with Abbas's Palestinian Authority in the region. Still, the Palestinian Authority isn't well regarded by the Palestinians anymore. They are, however, staunch opponents of Hamas. 
Blinken argued that a ceasefire would only allow Hamas to regroup, but is trying to convince Israel to agree to a location-specific pauses that would allow much-needed aid to the distributed within Gaza. Now, Netanyahu, Israel's prime minister, has pushed back against the U.S. pressure to start implementing pauses in the fighting, saying that there would be no temporary ceasefire until Hamas releases some 240 foreign hostages in its holding. Now, the Pentagon has confirmed that the U.S. is conducting unarmed UAV flights over Gaza, as well as providing advice and assistance to support our Israeli partner as they work on their hostage recovery efforts. Now, last month, the U.S. Navy said it had shot down multiple drones and rockets fired from Yemen that were appearing to head towards Israel, which is almost 3,000 kilometers to the north. And Yemen has the Hutus, who are aligned with Hezbollah and also heavily supported by Iran. Also, the CIA chief is visiting Israel and other Middle Eastern nations this week, so there's no denying that the U.S. is vested in the conflict at both overt and covert levels. But still, that level of involvement is not strong enough to force Israel to cease fire, and Israel's not going to probably do that. So that's the overview of where this conflict is in its first month since Hamas attack, and it's a lot to understand, and it's overwhelming enough that you might miss the most alarming parts and some of the other behind-the-scenes involvements. Countries who at all support Israel had also better raise their terror alerts because Tehran is issuing some pretty heavy threats and is just short of calling uh, for a holy war over this. And as I pointed out in last week's video, the real winner here is guess who? Russia. Moscow and Tehran have met quite frequently and built a partnership since Russia invaded Ukraine. And Russia is using Iranian drones nearly daily to attack Ukraine. Iran is set to join the anti-West, pro-Southern Hemisphere BRICS alliance in January. BRICS is seeking a new world order that benefits aligned countries by turning a blind eye towards their aggressive nationalistic policies. And whether that's the reunification of the Soviet states or China's Uyghur genocide, so long as a country supports an anti-Western policy and business is good, the violence or injustices they inflict on the world can be overlooked and ignored. Here at City Prepping, we have been covering aspects of this emerging new world order for several years. And we're beginning to see this play out right in front of us in real time now. If we look at just the BRICS country's involvement in and around the Israeli-Gaza conflict, we can clearly see the other side of the world war brewing. And Russia's paramilitary group, the Wagner Group, plans to supply Hezbollah in Lebanon with an air defense system. The system in question, the Russian SA-22, combines anti-aircraft missiles and guns to counteract Israeli aircraft. But look, providing defense is one thing, but what you may not know about the Russian defense systems are how they are easily repurposed and converted to an offensive weapon. We've most recently seen this in Russia's war with Ukraine. Russia denies that they plan to send this equipment, but in the same statement, they claim that the Wagner Group does it exist, which we know it does. How much Russia can support as it wages its own war remains to be seen. We also see Russia's reformulated Wagner Group strategy to take over resource-rich Central Africa. And Russia is moving to expand its military presence in eastern Libya, a plan that could lead to a naval base, giving it a significant foothold on Europe's southern doorstep. Now, currently, they use Libya to support operations in the Burkina Faso, the Central African Republic, and several other African nations where Russia has actively aligned with the rebellion groups. Now, the Israeli military says Hamas has fired over 5,000 missiles toward the country since the war began, and those missiles were not built in Gaza. Iran supplied them. Israeli intelligence in 2021 estimated Hamas and Islamic Jihad, another militant group operating in Gaza, had some 30,000 missiles in their arsenal. Now, the U.S. has estimated Hezbollah and other militant groups in Lebanon have some 150,000 missiles in rockets. Again, these were not built in Lebanon. Iran supplied them. And as we indicated a few weeks back, China, the sea in bricks, has sent its naval vessels to the Persian Gulf to monitor the situation as Iranian attack boats continue to seize international vessels in the region. Now, the U.S. Navy is also heavily represented in the tight water. So what could go wrong, right? Apart from those significant moves by major players, some mid-sized players are also choosing sides in this Israel-Gaza conflict. Bolivia's left-wing government cut diplomatic ties with Israel, alleging crimes and human rights abuses in Gaza, as Chile and Colombia recall their ambassadors. And more centrally located in the conflict region, Turkey also recalled their ambassador to Israel and broke off all contact with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. Also in Turkey, pro-Islamic protesters 
are protesting on a joint Turkish and U.S. military air base that the Secretary of State is visiting this week. This is going to further put pressure on Turkey to align from Israel and towards Russia and Iran. And as I pointed out last week, this is especially problematic because Turkey is part of NATO and the UN, and the country controls the waterways to access the Black Sea in Ukraine. Turkey also hosts U.S. and NATO military infrastructure and is the gatekeeper to NATO's southeastern flank. Turkey has already had probably too much influence over Norway and Sweden joining NATO. And the country's alliances and loyalties are really something to watch. If they swing heavily towards Moscow or Tehran, the world may be on the brink of a much more significant conflict. So you may be asking how will this all impact you and your life? And it's from all these little alliances, secret deals, and global power dynamic shifts that we will see continued and severe strain on the supply chains and drag on global economies. And for instance, Saudi Arabia and Russia, they plan to continue additional voluntary oil cuts to keep the per barrel price of oil painfully and artificially high. I'm sure you noticed that at the pumps. You may not have noticed directly the fiscal impact of the trade war with China or the loss of Ukraine exports with the Bosphorus Strait, but these are impacting supply and economies worldwide. And while another winter sets in across Europe, the loss of Russian oil and natural gas will continue to be felt. Countries that are merely supplying equipment to these conflicts will eventually have to adopt a wartime economy, or there simply won't be enough material resources to deliver. Now, since the conflict in Ukraine began, the U.S. troop presence in Europe has surged to over 100,000 for the first time in decades. U.S. forces in and around the Middle East are increasing in number, and Russia is supplying weapons even as it continues its offense in Ukraine and against the world through oil cuts. Ukraine continues to defend itself against Russia as Turkey increasingly sides with adversaries of the West. And Finland and Sweden's long-held neutrality is over as country after country is choosing sides in a coming global conflict. And all the pieces are there, all the dry kindling is there for this to explode into a direct confrontation between nuclear superpowers. And look, I don't want to stoke the fires of fear and doom and gloom here, but we have to acknowledge that we are heading headlong into at the low end, supply chain disruptions and failing global economies, and at the high end, an all-out world war. And at some point, waging wars through proxy militant groups will no longer be effective. Israel wiping out Hamas isn't likely going to happen because with each missile, each bomb or bullet, they build Hamas's populist support. Yet, shouldn't they be able to counterattack when attacked? So the only outcome can be a swift march to a ceasefire where Israel is satisfied Hamas is significantly degraded enough to pose a threat no longer. And we are following the news of Hezbollah's reaction and Iran and Russia's proxy war through them. And as the battle lines there continue to get blurrier, superpowers come closer to direct confrontations in places like Syria, the Gulf of Oman, the Strait of Hormuz, and pretty much every country that borders Israel at this point. You need to understand how this can quickly escalate and prepare like a coming world war is possible. Panama Canal. Another threat to the global supply chain can be found in Panama. And this is one that we have been monitoring for about a year now, but we didn't really feel that it rose to a level of urgency enough to bring it on this channel. Well, I think it does now. The Panama Canal operates through a system of locks and man-made waterway, allowing ships to traverse between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Ships enter locks that raise or lower them to the level of Gatan, Alajuela, and Miraflores lakes that feed the lock system. Now, the process is reversed at the other end, enabling vessels to complete the 50-mile journey across the Isthmus of Panama. And the problem that the canal is now experiencing is with the freshwater lakes that allow the locks to function. Panama is undergoing a massive, never-before-seen drought, and these freshwater lakes are historically low. At the beginning of the year, the Panama Canal authorities reduced the daily capacity for ship transits from approximately 36 to 31 due to lower water levels affecting the lock system. Now, they're further decreasing that limit to 25, and it's projected to drop to 18 by February of next year. This change is anticipated to lead to higher prices for goods and compel cargo vessels to opt for the more fuel-intensive route around Cape Horn. Now, last year, 518 million tons of cargo passed through the canal, and a reduction of 18 daily ships would drop 518 tons of cargo annually to half. Now, the added fuel costs to transit around the Cape Horn make the final cost of goods sometimes too high to justify the exports. And when the cost can't reasonably be assigned to consumers, the product simply won't ship. 
Perhaps in an early sign of this reduction in shipping and the slowing of global supply chains, the shipping giant Maersk just announced it will be cutting 10,000 jobs. Maersk controls about one-sixth of the international container trade. And the Panama Canal facilitates the transportation of diverse cargoes, including petroleum and petroleum products like asphalt, crude oil, diesel oil, gasoline, jet fuel, and kerosene, container cargo, grains such as corn, soy, and wheat, chemicals and petroleum chemicals, uh, including LPG and liquefied natural gas carriers, coal and coke, and ores and metals. And as if we haven't seen enough of a price rise in every single one of those, if this Panama Canal situation continues along the same trajectory, we're going to see even more increases in the first half of next year. Now look, I want to alert you to this problem now because a real impact is felt next year. Giveaway. For this week's giveaway, we'll give away potassium iodide tablets. In a future video, I'll use a tool to draw the winner from the comments of the video randomly. Look, I'm not going to contact you unless your name appears on the screen next week. The subscriber, Kim Preston, is the winner of the last video's giveaway of the Kadenden Hiker Water Filter. Congrats, I'll reach out to you shortly to get that sent to you. Ukraine. Things look to be shaping up into a stalemate in Ukraine. Now, on one hand, that's good news as there's a cooling off in this part of the world, and I'm sure we all breathe easier when we know we don't have to worry daily about the nuclear power plant leaks or a hypersonic missile. It also means a harsh winter weather will soon set in, making ground offenses nearly impossible. It literally puts a freeze on the war. And in the war-torn Donetsk region, soldiers stationed near the front line have noted a significant increase in Russian artillery activity in recent weeks. Now, however, it remains below the levels observed a year ago as both sides struggle to advance. There's been a broader trend of decreased Russian artillery shelling compared to a year ago, resulting in a more static and positional war with minimal movement in the front lines. Additionally, there have been reports that North Korea supplied over a million shells to Russia since August, although both Moscow and Pyongyang denied such arms transfers. The war is far from over, however. Ukraine managed to sink another Russian battleship, and Ukrainian forces sank one of the most advanced ships of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, a caliber cruise missile carrier, following explosions in Russian-occupied Crimea on November the 4th. Now, the ship's destruction was confirmed the following day, marking a significant development in the ongoing conflict. And the Russian Defense Ministry admitted that a warship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet docked at a shipyard in the Kirsch had been damaged. And Zelensky came out and just said what many of us were already knowing, that the Israeli-Gaza conflict was taking the focus away from the war in Ukraine and that this is one of the goals of Russia. Now, he denied that there was a stalemate, but admitted that Russia controls the skies and the winter would allow them even further to dig in where they have occupied Ukraine. That will make the next spring offensive more complex and probably less effective than what we saw this year. Now, this winter is going to be a real test of the world's willingness to continue to stand against Russian aggression. You can expect that as government budget talks intensify, you're also going to see some deepening divisions over funding for support for Ukraine and Israel. Sea surface temperature. To say that the world is in uncharted waters here is probably literally true. There's a chart that tracks sea surface temperatures that goes back 40 years, and current global sea surface temperatures are that line on the top separate from anything that we've seen in the last 40 years. I'm going to link to this chart in the comments below if you want to explore that more. What it illustrates, at least to me, is that there are quite a few unknowns to exactly how these high numbers will manifest in our daily lives. The scientific community is sounding a lot of alarms over this issue. We can see the related impact in the form of melting ice caps and droughts in some places and floods in others. Now, our understanding of it all is really pretty limited, though. We're just beginning to understand how these are all interrelated at some level. But one thing is for sure, the El Nino cycle we're currently facing will be stoked by these warm sea surface temperatures. It will significantly intensify the weather events in that pattern. If you are going to get a dry cold, it will be drier and colder. If you are going to get a warm, wet winter, it would be wetter simply because of more moisture in the air. And if you're in one of the areas we discuss getting a once-in-a-lifetime blizzard, the Big Daddy Snowstorm in our winter video, well, you're still on track for that. I know anything that addresses long-term patterns and averages of weather conditions, also known as climate, is a major hot-button issue for our community, and, and it shouldn't be. I realize it gets wrapped up with politics, and again, it shouldn't be. It should be instead something that we seriously look at to understand the impact it's going to have on our preps. And if we ignore these obvious signs, it's at our own peril. Now, the natural disasters you will face the rest of this year and next are genuine threats to your safety and well-being. 
There's nothing intangible or theoretical there. There is nothing hidden or buried in some chart somewhere. The time to prepare for extreme weather events in the coming winter and next year is right now. You should keep an eye and an open mind to some of these indicators tipping charts everywhere, even as you continue to prep for the worst. Now, as always, dude, let me just wrap up this video by, again, as we all look at the situation, what's playing out in the world, uh, I think this week, it seems like the main theme, at least, you know, as we prepare this content is, you know, it's just another, <clears throat> just another uh, step that's being taken, I would say, in this repositioning, this realignment of world powers with Russia and China and, you know, the BRICS alignment taking on one side and the Western, you know, America and, and Europe. You're seeing this, this strong uh, conflict that appears to be heading, um, you know, to... I don't know, to a crescendo, something. I, I don't know the right term, but it's clear that these something's you know going to play out where these events will align in such a way that initial, eventually conflict will occur. And again, as I pointed out in the video, so much of this at the moment is just proxy wars. Ukraine and Russia. Well, America's behind Ukraine and Russia's on the other side. Now we're seeing this again with Iran, uh, you know, with what they're doing with Israel, supplying Hezbollah and Hamas. And it just, you know, who's Iran's tied to Russia. And so when you begin to piece everything together, it just seems like the, the pieces are being put in place, I guess is what the phrase I'm looking for. And it's concerning and alarming. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that something major is going to come out of it, but it definitely feels like it's coming to a head is, I guess, what I'm trying to say. And in all that, uh, the other issues that we brought up, we will still continue to see price increases on so many things. Inflation will continue to march on. That's just a reality. In my encouragement, as I'll always say, is take advantage of the time that you have now. This is the time that we have at this moment. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. All we have is now. I can't change what's happened in the past. I wish I could go back and make changes or do things or have prepped and said, you know, more aggressively when things were more affordable, right? But here we are and we have to take advantage of this time. Now, again, I mentioned at the beginning of the video, we launched a community and this is one of the main things among many that we're trying to do is have a place where we can come together, discuss these issues, find solutions, help one another, and as I, you know, been trying to point out lately in a video I even released uh, on Monday, I'm at a point now in my life where I realize I need others. And I hope you feel the same because what we need to move forward is really going to be more than just what we can do on our own. And that's why I think community, as I always try to talk about in this channel, is so, so important. So I'm hoping this tool that we released, I encourage you to go check it out. Again, just visit cityprepping.com and you can click on the Join Us uh, Today tab and it'll take you over to uh, our membership sign-up page. I'm excited to see you there and we've got several videos lined up this week where we'll do live YouTube hangouts and hope to see you there. If you, have, if you have any feedback or any questions, feel free to post that below. And as always, stay safe out there.